In January of 1958, two days after the ringing in of the New Year, the West Indies Federation became the flagship for the political ascendancy and unity of the colonies in the British West Indies. We were not really prepared for the Federation. It was really imposed on us. In its ill-fated voyage through the rough seas of Caribbean intrigue and controversy, the hopes and aspirations of some three million people sank with the demise of the Federation on 31st May. 1962. If I can go back into the Federation, uh, that I was, in the early days, I, I was part of the team. And I seen at one time how keen the, the small islands were, the, the OECS were, to get on with it, to be involved, to get uh, an independent uh, Caribbean. Uh, uh, once they had got the stronger, uh, uh, more involved in, in, in the governmental process, once they got more power, they start looking inwards rather than outwards. The, the feeling was, there was one view that perhaps if the Federation had started off as an independent federal uh, state, that they, that might have attracted some of the more senior politicians to participate in it. If the politicians really give the people a chance, we'd be much further ahead than we are. Nevertheless, the resulting emotional air was but short-lived because it was from this hopeless wreckage that Caribbean peoples emerged with renewed vigor to rebuild their ships of state and chart a fresh course towards the socio-economic and political destination of their dreams. After a decade of much trial and error by the captains of government in the Caribbean community, the 1973 Treaty of Chagaramas was finally crafted to navigate the choppy waters of history, to weather the political storms, and to secure our own socio-economic survival in the achievement of our dream. Harking back to the late Forbes Burnham's axiomatic warning to the region in 1967, the Treaty of Chagaramas became the Caribbean people's beacon of hope and a signal for all hands on deck in a stronger commitment to integrate or perish. It was common knowledge that the breakup of the West Indies Federation created waves of frustration and suspicion among regional leaders. Despite this, their thoughts and speeches remain imbued with a sense of optimism and hope, making it clear that the death knell for Caribbean unity was yet to be sounded, because the areas of common interest surpassed by far any thoughts of narrow parochialism. The first is the need to deal with common services that existed before Federation and would have to continue after Federation. The University of the West Indies, the Caribbean Med Service, the Shipping Corporation, all of which were important parts of the region. The first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, the late Dr. Eric Eustace Williams, braved the unpredictable political climate and engineered the recommencement of the integration process. He was convinced that the gathering of forces of Caribbean history would wash away the debris of suspicion and rancor. Evidently, even though Federation had collapsed, the idea of Caribbean integration did not end. And here, I think, the, Dr. Williams' view of the region became so central to this. Several Caribbean countries 
were aligned with a metropolitan power, or many more than are today, that did not give them the room, the flexibility, to choose who their partners will be. The urgent need to unite and create a regional economic movement had led Williams of Trinidad and Tobago to convene in July of 1963 this first meeting of the heads of government of the Commonwealth Caribbean with Barra of Barbados, Jagan of British Guyana and Bustamante of Jamaica to define and expand the area of common agreement and to map a new direction for Caribbean integration. Dr. Williams' desire to restart the integration process gave courage to other leaders of the region and so in 1965, Ver Bird of Antigua, Forbes Burnham of British Guyana and Errol Barrow of Barbados met at Dickinson Bay in Antigua and out of their deliberations came the Dickinson Bay Agreement which formed the launching pad for the subsequent establishment of the Caribbean Free Trade Area, CARIFTA, in 1968. First of all, I, I think you have to start by recognizing that CARIFTA was a modest arrangement, but it was vital. We were coming out of the post-federal trauma, and uh, we were a bit floundering in the, in the, in the international environment. We, we weren't really quite sure where we were going. We just had a recent independence, so there was a, a sort of newness to the process. And CARIFTA was able to kick us off to intra-regional Treat. The objective in forming CARIFTA was to try to develop a large economic space in which there would be freer movement of goods among the members of CARIFTA and, and there would be a certain amount of protection within CARIFTA against goods coming from outside of the Carifta region. By then, the, the countries that now called the OECS, they had moved out uh, into semi-independence in by 1968. They all had, asso had uh, attained the associated statehood with Britain and therefore they were capable of making decisions without reference to, to Britain. So from there, uh, we start, instead of looking more and more outside into Europe, etc. We started looking inward towards ourselves, try to consolidate what we have. In Carifta, interestingly enough, started a process of what we call functional cooperation. I remember the early days, the Carifta Secretariat was as much a health secretariat with uh, Dr. Boyd. And health and education became very important aspects of regional cooperation, of course, in the case of education leading up to the creation of the CXC. So, it started with those two big areas, intra-regional trade and functional cooperation among the states. At the fifth Heads of Government Conference of the Commonwealth Caribbean in 1969, Caribbean leaders were convinced that Williams' plunge into the deep was indeed a bold one, but appropriate to a world dominated increasingly by regional economic groupings. You had the Central American Common Market in 1960. You had the East African community in, I think it was 67, and you had something called LAFTA, Latin American Free Trade Area. Now, all those fell by the wayside, if at least temporarily. The Central American Common Market after the so-called football war went down and is now partially resuscitated. The East African community collapsed completely, as you recall, and they are now being re-established and interestingly enough came to CARICOM recently to learn about our experience when we had in fact copied from their experience and their treaty to form CARICOM in 60, in CARIFTA in 68 and CARICOM later on. And laughter, well I think that has just laughed out. We have just not, we don't know, I don't know if Sela has taken on some of what was laughter. Europe has forged ahead from the European economic community into a European Union. As the West Indian concern for integration increased, it became one that transcended mere economics. For Williams, it began with the charting of a new Caribbean identity, one that rejected boundaries determined by European and American rivalry over the centuries. When Dr. Williams wrote that, he was thinking of the Caribbean as being mostly the islands, the uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, um, as well as the English-speaking islands, the French-speaking, the Dutch-speaking, um, all of which had been kind of isolated by the effects of colonial rule um, from one another, so that we spoke about 
the West Indies, we spoke about West Indians, we meant English speaking West Indians and uh, in Cuba and Puerto Rico they, sp they spoke about uh, El Caribe or Las Antillas and so on. Um, that necessity still holds but we have gone beyond that as well in terms of talking about the Caribbean as the entire community of nations which shares the space of the Caribbean Sea. But just as there was a groundswell in favor of closer intra-Caribbean ties, so too were there strong currents sweeping political leaders in the direction of self-determination. In the agitated waters of the 1960s, Norman Manley of Jamaica, Dr. Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago, Errol Barrow of Barbados, and Forbes Burnham of Guyana had successfully steered their countries towards the moorings of political independence. We have looked forward with considerable pleasure to our entry into the Commonwealth family. Now that this goal has been achieved, I ask you to convey to Her Majesty an expression of our unfailing loyalty and devotion to her throne and person. We have been inspired by her good wishes and we pledge ourselves to fulfill the promise expected of us, not only by Her Majesty, but by all the nations of the world, to show how our small community with its people drawn from many lands of diverse racial origins and subscribing to a variety of religious beliefs can, in harmonious cooperation, make its contribution to the sum total of world peace, world progress, and world happiness. Independence was not the only thing that they needed to do. Now they had to have diplomatic missions, they had to negotiate trade agreements. Many of the agreements that they inherited were agreements that they had when they were part of the British Empire. Now they had to renegotiate those. So there was a need for continued working together in the, in the region. And so this was part of the, the, the impetus, it seems to me. At the same time, it, the independence movement influenced the architecture of the regional movement because federation or political unity was removed from the agenda. Any integration movement after that had to occur in situations that did not include political unity. So th this, I think, was the, really the impact and the continuing, frankly, impact of the breakup of the Federation. From the historical convergence of caravels and canoes at the port of Hispaniola in 1492 to the historic emergence of the famous dictum, one from ten leaves north in Port of Spain, 1962, to the dynamic resurgence of Caribbean integration in Chagoramas, 1973, the Caribbean Sea, that glistening jewel in our necklace of island states, remains the common witness to the conflicts, conspiracies, conquests, and controversies of West Indian political history. Long seen as a separating element, the waters washing our shores began emerging as a symbol of Caribbean integration. They no longer divide us, but join us. The Caribbean Sea, whose tides are as similar as the traditions, heritage, and history that we all share, represented the dream, the driving force that led the Treaty of Chaguranas and the creation of CARICOM, the Caribbean Community and Common Market. This CARICOM will exert a growing influence upon the lives of its people, although they are located over vast expanses of sea and land. That influence will be an amalgam of attitudes, of thoughts, of economics and psychology that together should truly liberate us, making us 
be less as trespassers and more as full participants in the world's field. CARICOM, in a word, will provide the dynamics to propel the new Caribbean man. 1970s, after the, the, oil, uh, the oil crisis, etc., things really started getting a little rough for the Caribbean. And one thing that was fortunate for us is that Willie Dimas came aboard around that time and uh, he started writing a number of articles. He, he hastened the pace. Uh, and we had an, uh, an other institutions coming in, into play. We had the Caribbean Development Bank. We had the, the CARICOM Secretariat established. And we had persons like Willie DeMass and Alistair McIntyre and those persons who really pushed the politicians along. And uh, they moved from CARIFTA into CARICOM. And, uh, uh, the whole process starts uh, getting deeper and wider. They said that your young men shall dream dreams, your old men shall see visions. I'm seeing the vision. I accept my age. I am seeing the vision of a real unity in the Caribbean arising out of this Treaty of Shangaram. We must think, first of all, of our countries as part of a greater whole each one part of the greater whole. We must think of our resources in their totality. The high literacy of Barbados, its beautiful beaches, the high intelligence of its peoples, the entrepreneurial skills of Jamaica, the beaches, the bauxite, the imagination of the peoples of Trinidad and Tobago, their oil, the dense forests of Guyana and its mineral resources. All these, I contend, are the resources of the Caribbean. And it is incumbent upon us, if we want progress, to stop considering ourselves as a number of separate units. CARICOM has been recognized internationally as one of the big successes of regional integration movement. And I think that um, we should be proud of that in the Caribbean because we have a tendency to overly criticize our institutions and our academic people tend to be um, very pedantic about Caribbean institutions and, and require a higher standard from us than they do from other countries in the international forum. So that um, I would say that um, CARICOM um, through the 70s and 80s, with all of the tribulations that went with it, the whole question of ideological pluralism, which put a heavy strain on the different um, countries in dealing with each other's intersey and in making decisions in CARICOM, because CARICOM presumes that there is a kind of a similarity in the constitutional and operational ethos these countries. So um, I think that uh, we can be proud, but there's so much more work to be done. And we have arrived at a juncture where very important seminal decisions will have to be made if we're going to get to the next level. All of us here today, the genuine representatives of the Caribbean with a common history based on the Caribbean Trinity, colonialism, monoculture, with its polyethnic labor force and racism are the symbols of fragmentation, with its concomitants of its association with the rival metropolitan economies and isolation of one territory from another. There can be no dispensation which does not mean the integration of the fragmented economies of the people of the Caribbean, by the people of the Caribbean, for the people of the Caribbean. But clearly, um, the statement is one of a, a serious um, profit. Uh, as um, the great Dr. Eric Williams uh, has, was in fact uh, seen in the region and internationally so. Um, I think it is very clear that over the years we have spent a lot of time trying to build and ties an international arena and we have not looked inwardly to some of the strengths that we have. Uh, even on the whole question of economic relationship there have there are products that we attempt to sell internationally that, that there are tremendous market in the region. Take, for example, a banana market. There are tremendous um, opportunities within the region for sale of a, of a banana product from the producing countries 
to other islands in the region and I think we have not done so done very well in trying to use the opportunities there I also believe in the whole question of uniting our forces on on the economic front pro provide a stronger basis when we attempt to negotiate with any f forces from the international arena I think we have to look more in that direction the question of transport we we have easy access of transport to to North America and Europe but we have great difficulties in getting to each other at, uh, in a, with, among the islands in the region. I think we have to work tremendously on this. I think that's one of the areas of serious weakness. So I agree with him. I think we, we must be looking a lot more internally if we hope to confront and deal with the problems that we face and, in the international arena, in, the, in fact, in the new global village that the world is becoming. All human progress begins with the courage to take that step into the unknown. We in Jamaica have regarded this occasion as implied in our mandate from the people of Jamaica last year. We have debated it in our parliament. We have had full and fruitful discussions with our institutional leaders about the aspects of the common market which we now enter upon and the community which we are now joining. And we have explained calmly, but I hope clearly, that it is inevitable when countries from separate posture of their sovereignty seek to create new and meaningful relationships that there must be compromise and that compromise is justified by the size of the goals we pursue. Errol Barrow, the former Prime Minister of Barbados, was well known in his lifetime for his commitment to Caribbean integration. He too had a vision for the community that was people-centered. He was convinced that the collective wisdom of the Caribbean people was more valuable in a certain sense than other factors which made for unity and team effort. The promise of the regional integration movement, even in the area of trade, cannot be realized unless we find new ways of communicating to the mass of our people the meaning and purpose of all our regional institutions. And that's one reason, if no other could be found, why the University of the West Indies must at all costs retain its regional character and why the university must move away from the confines of the campus more and more into the heart of the communities which constitute our region. The University of the West Indies, like our cricket team, has become a symbol of team effort with all the attendant possibilities for greatness and achievement started as the University College of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. The UWI eventually expanded to include campuses in St. Augustine in Trinidad and Tobago and Cape Hill in Barbados. The University of the West Indies at Mona has nearly 1,500 students from all over the Caribbean. Here, the Chancellor, Her Royal Highness Princess Alice, Countess of Athlone, waited to receive the Queen, who was also her great niece. The welcoming crowd surged forward to throng around the Queen and her husband who stopped to talk informally with a number of students. Many leaders in our region have been graduates of this tertiary institution. Over the years, its accomplishments have inspired us to hold it up as vital to the philosophy of unity and integration, and pivotal in the accomplishment of a balanced economic development of the region. The Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture, Trinidad, must be regarded as a federal institution destined to play a major role in the economic future of the West Indies. The college, founded in 1921, carries out special research schemes in cocoa, banana, sugar, soil science, and major tropical crops. Students come here from all parts of the Commonwealth for training in methods of agriculture. Well, the university existed before even the movement and was part and parcel of the whole movement towards political independence, regional identity, and so on. But the university itself became a part of the thrust towards regional integration. If you recall, the studies that were done on integration during this period, the Brewster Thomas study, the work that was undertaken by Sir Alistair McIntyre, much of the thinking that preceded this movement occurred within the university. I recall when I was uh, on the faculty 
in St. Augustine in 1966-67. Several members of the faculty there, including Sir Alistair uh, and so on, were mm, going around Trinidad talking about economic integration. As I said, the studies, the New World Group talked about what they should do. So the university, I think, provided the ideas, it provided the the, the recommendations for the structures and individually people like Sir Alistair through his contacts with Mr. DeMas and through that of course to, um, to Dr. Williams played significant role throughout this period. I think the people uh, usually have been ahead of the leaders. Uh, <coughs> for instance, the, our integration movement, we speak about the integration movement, didn't start in, in the 1960s. We, we formalized it. But before, the people were moving, there was freedom of movement of peoples. We, <coughs> the, the interaction of peoples moving from one area to the other, from Barbados to Trinidad to Guyana to, to, the, to the Caribbean, has been there long before the politicians gave it a name. It's the politicians in trying to formalize that sort of thing uh, and, and restructure it uh, are in fact impeding what was already an informal movement that we've known over the years. In 1973, ten years after their first attempt to bring their turbulent relationship back into ship shape, Caribbean leaders returned to Trinidad and Tobago for the signing of the Treaty of Chagaramas. The biggest challenge to their ability to sink or float was whether centuries of individualism could be buried in one decade of cooperation. For this uh, treaty, for this which we are going to sign, for this community, for this common market which we are going to establish, they are the framework for real unity amongst us. They, I hope, will represent a departure from our long tradition of diversity and our common misorientation outside of the area. And I hope that they spell even more than that. I hope that they spell our determination to achieve economic independence, yes, independence, as distinct from the mendicancy which has been part of our tradition. I hope that they spell also a determination to achieve political and social unity within the Caribbean, without which we shall perish, and that is my conviction. These are my personal views. I believe that all Caribbean ought to be more closely in it. The Caribbean ought to be more closely in it. By that I mean closer links with Cuba, closer links with Dominican Republic, closer links with the DOMS, closer links with the OCTs. I believe closer links with Puerto Rico, closer links with in the, the Caribbean as a region, in my view, need to be more closely linked up. We are too still desperate out here, the French this, the Dutch this, the English this, the Spanish this. We need to come together and have a Caribbean's Caribbean. This television documentary was based on the book Integrate or Perish, Perspectives of Leaders of the Integration Movement, 1963 to 1999, edited by Professor Kenneth O'Hall, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the West Indies. Morning.